So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's afternoon here in the UK. So good afternoon to everyone, but good morning um, to some others who are, I think are joining us from um, across the Atlantic. Uh, and welcome to our um, webinar on uh, what is Fair Wild. So we're going to hopefully explain to everyone and give a bit of an introduction, set the scene um, and explain a bit more about what Fair Wild is, maybe answer questions you've, you've had about, you know, what, what is Fair Wild about um, and try and give an overview to all the activities that Fair Wild uh, does. Right, so what are we going to be covering today? Well, first of all, we're going to set the scene a bit and um, talk about why wild, we should care about wild plants at all um, and really set the scene for why Fair Wild um, exists and how it came about. Um, then I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, Bryony um, to talk a bit more about what Fair Wild actually is. Um, and then I will uh, talk about what different ways that you can get involved. Um, so different sort of avenues for different types of businesses or different organizations or um, even members of the public. Um, and then we'll have a uh, question and answer session as well. Uh, so to introduce myself, uh, so I'm Emily King. I'm the business engagement officer for the Fair Wild Foundation. Um, and my role is really to um, help businesses to understand both what uh, Fair Wild is about and also how um, their role uh, in the wild plant trade chain uh, can really be used for, as a force for good um, to both support fair trade and also sustainable harvesting, um, hopefully through Fair Wild. So I think one of the first questions then to really think about is, you know, if, so Fair Wild e exists and we'll hear more about exactly what, what we do later from Bryony. But first of all, why is there a need for Fair Wild um, and a focus on wild plant sustainability at all? So wild plants um, are prevalent uh, throughout many industries. Uh, their, their ingredients are used in a, a variety of different ways. There are about uh, 28,000 species which have well-documented medicinal and aromatic uses. And of those, about 3,000 are traded internationally. So that's a very large number, a, a great array of diversity in international trade. And of those, we think, uh, well, we know the majority are sourced through wild harvest. The exact percentage um, does differ. So it, we think it's somewhere between 60% and 90% 90 of species are wild harvested. But either way, it is a very significant proportion. We also see that uh, the actual volume of that trade is increasing as well. Um, so, for example, uh, looking at international trade data from UN Comtrade, we can see that the value of trade as a, you know, as a proxy for volume um, has increased uh, three time, threefold um, over uh, the last couple of decades. Um, the, it really is a global trade as well. So we've got importers, um, you know, in, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, North America, Europe, um, and it is ingredients are also exported from all over the world as well. So um, we've got India, uh, North America, um, Europe again as well. And that's just the top importers and exporters. It re there are many countries in um, Africa, for example, Baobab is um, heavily in trade from as a wild plant ingredient from Africa as well. Um, and many ingredients are also traded in smaller quantities, but um, from a wide range of countries as well. Um, so it's not just that there are a large number of species, but it's also a growing trade as well. When we talk to people about uh, wild plant species, one of the common hurdles is just trying to understand, you know, what are these species? What, what do we mean when we talk about um, wild plant species in trade? Um, and as I said, there's a, there's a huge number of species, but it, it can be helpful to think about um, just a smaller number that represent the, the challenges and also opportunities present in wild plant trade. Um, so we talk about uh, the wild dozen, um, so these are 12 species which really represent um, both, as I said, the challenges and opportunities of wild plant sourcing there. Um, and we can talk more about that um, at the, in the Q&A session as well. There's various reports available online that delve into that more. Um, but it's, it's a nice way of thinking about and talking to, to people about, okay, well, what do we really mean by this? So it might be the frankincense that you, is used in um, you know, cosmetics or in religious ceremonies. It might be um, candelia, which is um, extremely prevalent in cosmetic use. Um, it might be baobab, which is now um, very sort of 
more commonly used in uh, sort of supplements in the EU, for example, um, and Brazil nuts. Many people don't even realize that those are um, wild sourced. So it's really helpful as a way to tell these stories to um, people that might not be familiar with um, how prevalent these species are in trade. And when we think about these species, it's not just the, um, you know, the, the species themselves, but also the people that are doing the harvesting. And whilst they are, the, you know, species are harvested all over the globe, um, so it's a, a very wide variety of um, species and, and situations and habitats, there are a lot of commonalities between, uh, that we can see between the people that are doing the harvesting. Um, often it is uh, people in lower income communities that are uh, carrying out wild plant harvesting. Um, they're reliant on this trade, not just for um, often a substantial proportion of their income, but also for um, health and traditional remedy use. Um, a large part of the trade is also informal, um, so it might not be formally recorded, um, it might be, uh, you know, sort of done without um, records, um, and therefore underreported. Um, the people doing the harvesting also often have to cope with what can be quite complex regulations, so that's not just at the national level, um, but it might also be at the international level, so for example, plant species um, might be listed on appendices of CITES, so that's a Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, which um, governs international trade in, in some species. Um, and there's also sort of international agreements um, to understand as well. There's also been a decline in collector numbers um, and loss of traditional knowledge and practices, mainly um, due to sort of rural to urban migration. Um, so it's practices which might have been um, handed down between generations with uh, increasing movements to the cities and disconnect from, from nature, that um, practice can be lost. Um, and it also means there's fewer people doing the collecting. So we have both the, um, the, the impact of trade on the species themselves. Um, so we've got the volume of trade, uh, being high, the large number of species involved, um, therefore the diverse number of habitats being impacted. We've also got the people actually doing the harvesting, um, being in, in potentially in informal labour, um, reliant on this trade, um, but also it being at risk from the impact of the trade in terms of the, the volume of trade occurring. Um, However, we, there are lots of great opportunities, so it's not a, a bleak picture. I mean, it, it can be, but I think we want to celebrate the fact that there is um, scope for lots of opportunities here as well. Um, so, for example, there is a lot of um, increasing interest in consumer markets about the product origins. Um, so companies focusing on telling stories about um, the sourcing of ingredients, um, traceability to market and so on. Um, there also are best practices available, and we, we would say Fair Wild is, is definitely one of those, and it's recognised internationally as a best practice as well. Um, and Brian, you'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, policy and legislative frameworks are evolving, um, so we've not just got increasing consumer focus on sustainability and traceability, but um, also increasing focus on, for example, due diligence um, throughout trade chains um, at a regulatory level as well. Um, and it's great to be able to celebrate the potential for landscape level conservation. So it's not just, for example, about um, a baobab fruit that's being harvested in Africa, but it's also about the potential for that fruit harvest to protect not just the baobab trees, but also the wider area, which can be a habitat for elephants, for example. So that sort of sets the scene as to why we care about wilds, um, and that leads on to what uh, is Fair Wild. So what, what is Fair Wild's role and what, what do we do? Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, uh, Bryony Morgan. So Bryony is the Executive Officer for the Fair Wild Foundation, um, and she's gonna tell you more about what Fair Wild is. That's great, thanks very much, Emily. Um, it's brilliant scene setting there. Okay, next slide, thanks. Okay, so the Fair Wild Foundation is a Swiss registered nonprofit organization. We have the mission to enable the transformation of resource management and business practices to be sustainable throughout the supply chain for wild collected products. We have our primary focus on what use of wild ingredients. So we work through a number of partnerships. Uh, a lot of different organizations contributed to the development of the standard at the establishment of the foundation. 
And uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of our most active collaborations that we have at the moment. So both Emily and I are hosted by Traffic, an NGO that works on wildlife trade issues around the world. Uh, WWF was also one of the partners in developing the standard. And we have some site-based collaborations with them. Uh, we maintain a partnership with the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group, a network of scientists who uh, collaborate with us, particularly on development of risk analysis procedures and looking at the species that are proposed for certification under Fair Wild. We're also starting to expand our own engagement with IUCN, particularly around fungi, for example, as, as well. Um, Profound is another organization that we work with quite closely. They do um, consultancy work and support, particularly around value chains and market access. And um, again, especially specialized on wild collected products. Uh, we also have a, a collaboration with Wildlife Friendly. So that's another standard and certification program focused on um, business enterprises that contribute to uh, conservation objectives for key species in different landscapes. So we're quite keen to explore dual certification in the future with, with Wildlife Friendly as well. Okay, next slide, thanks. So Fair Wild is a sustainability standard with an associated third party audited certification system. Um, it is focused on wild harvested plant ingredients. We're also hoping to expand our certification program to fungi and lichen in the future as well. Uh, it's a comprehensive framework for sustainable and fair trade in wild ingredients. So it combines fair trade principles with ecological sustainability as well. Um, it's used, one of the main ways that we work is through the certification program, but we also promote the standard for use more broadly. So it's also being incorporated into company policies and practices and, and sourcing systems. And we've also used it, seen it being used as the framework for uh, community-based resource management practices, and also incorporating some of these principles into national um, management systems and regulations for, for wild plant harvesting and trade. Okay. So our work is primarily focused on influencing business practices. So we provide the Fair Wild Standard and encourage um, business practices to, com to comply with the principles. And with our labeling system and our outreach, we also focus on influencing consumer choice and providing um, opportunities for uh, responsible use of wild plants to be communicated to the general public. So we are able to do some outreach. We can advise and assist people with projects in sustainable wild collection that are aiming to implement the Fair Wild Standard. And we can also provide some advice on the application of standards in other contexts as well. Next one. So the Fair Wild Standard itself is actually two standard setting initiatives that merged. One was focused much more on ecological sustainability and the other more on social and fair trade aspects. So we've put these together in our combined Fair Wild Standard version two, which is comprehensive across um, these range, ranges of issues that are associated with wild harvest. So it has quite a unique focus on wild collection. It is designed to be universally applicable, but obviously the implementation can be varied depending on the context. So in some parts of the world or with some species and geo geographies, uh, the ecological aspects will be more important and in other places, the social and fair trade issues will be more more the issues that need to be tackled, but you can use the Fair Wild Standard as a framework to work across those different issues. Okay. The principles themselves um, are covering, well, there's 11 principles. So 10 of them are applicable to wild collection operations. So the company or cooperative or group that's actually doing the wild harvesting, organizing it, so those cover four different areas, wild collection con 
and conservation. So both the sustainable use of the target plant, but we also look at how that harvesting um, fits into the landscape. So what are the, the landscape level impacts on the wider habitat and other species that might be present and impacted while the collection is taking place. On the social and fair trade side, we look very much at the contractual relationship between the wild collection company and the collectors that supply it. So are the people who are actually doing the harvesting, um, do they have a good and transparent communication? Are they treated fairly? Do they get information that they need about how much to be collected and where? Uh, Fairwild also examines the participation of children in wild collection activities. Because partic participation of children can actually be an important um, cultural aspect um, of wild collection. Often children do accompany their parents to wild collection sites and are involved in some way. It's not completely excluded, but the children should not be part of the workforce. So we follow the ILO convention on, on that and look at the age of the children and, and their role and whether they are actually part of the workforce contracted as collectors or if they are assisting in a way that's appropriate and safe for their age. Um, we also look at the benefits for collectors in their communities. So we look at the um, amount that they're paid. We have both a fair pricing system and also a premium. So an additional payment that is made as an investment to the collectors in their community. And Fairwild covers working conditions for workers in, in the wild collection operation. Um, do they have adequate PPE? Uh, do they have contracts and in the, we look at overtime and the treatment of, of pregnant women and vulnerable people. So we cover fair working conditions as well. On the legal and ethical side, this covers laws and regulations. So is the collection complying with relevant laws that might be in place both at the national level or so international? So for example, CITES. And it, does it fit with any legislation around protect, protected areas? But we don't just look at the formal laws. We also look at customary rights and um, land tenure issues and also particularly the role of indigenous people and the impact of the collection on, on communities and that are also present in the site. And finally, the there are a set of principles and criteria related to management and traceability. So responsible management practices, including conducting resource assessments and having management planning for the target species, but also delivering training and supervision of, of the collectors in practice. And then we look at responsible business practices. So traceability and quality aspects, for example, as well as cost calculations and financial viability of the operation. So those are all, the, all of the principles that are applicable to the wild collection operation. And finally, we have a very important 11th principle for the buyers of the wild collected ingredients. We promote commitment by the industry that is, is sourcing the, the wild collected ingredients. So we ask that buyers who are buying the fair wild certified ingredients that they commit to paying the fair prices and to also having fair trade relationships with their suppliers. So favorable conditions of trade, for example. Okay, next one, thanks. So Emily already mentioned that Fairwild is internationally uh, relevant and um, recognized. So our standard and our work is really focused on the site level. So what is happening and how do you define what sustainable collection at the company level or, or cooperative, but it is aligned to delivery of international commitments. So uh, very much in line with the principles of, of the CBD's, um, of the Convention on Biodiversity and the international commitments that have been made under that. And Fairwild is actually recognized in the toolkit for the global strategy on plant conservation as one of the ways that um, we can achieve our international targets on sustainable use of wild plants. Likewise, Fairwild has been reviewed in the context of implementation of CITES and found to be a very appropriate framework for um, 
the level of detail that's needed for trade in some of these most um, endangered species where there are concerns about the sustainability. And of course, Fair Wild also contributes on the social and fair trade sides so that complements any controls that are in place on um, conservation issues and um, can help address those issues as well. And finally, um, sustainable development goals are a framework where all actors can contribute and a lot of businesses are now really um, needing to show ways that they can take action to help achieve the sustainable, de de sustainable development goals. So Fairwild is an excellent way to take concrete action on some of these targets that are particularly relevant to the issue of wild trade. So gender equality, res responsible consumption and production, and um, poverty alleviation as well. Okay. So Fairwild is what, one of the most comprehensive and rigorous certifications for wild plants out there. We make a distinction in the implementation between low, medium and high risk plants, but we're one of the few frameworks that will really also provide a framework for using species that do have some conservation concerns attached. Um, because we have a very uh, comprehensive framework for high risk species. So you can actually use it as a program for species where there are some con conservation concerns throughout the range of the plant. Um, it's not an organic certification scheme, but it is complementary to organic. We have similar requirements on um, not using inputs and um, avoiding contamination. So quite often Fairwild is implemented together with organic. Uh, on the fair trade side, we have specialized principles that are really unique to wild collection, but they are broadly comparable to other fair trade certifications. So Fairwild is recognized under the Fair for Life program, for example, and Fairwild operators can feed into uh, Fair for Life certified um, businesses and, and products. So we're open to these sorts of strategic recognitions and collaborations as well. And I also already mentioned that we have a collaboration with the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network and some possibilities for co-implementation there. Okay, next one. So uh, final few slides from me. Um, why go down this route? Why, why pursue uh, a framework like Fair Wild? Well, I think the world is changing and consumers are changing. Um, research is still supporting the desire for, from the public to um, buy from businesses that have a positive impact in the world. And that's something that has remained even with the COVID-19 pandemics. It's really um, positive to see that a lot of consumers are still saying that they are making more sustainable choices even with the additional pressures on all of us and that they intend to do so. And this is against a backdrop really of increasing use of wild resources that we're seeing from the pandemic. So there are some indications that uh, there's even more demand um, for products that are around health and well-being, and this is putting additional pressure on um, supply chains for wild ingredients. There is some evidence starting to, to build up around that. Um, but alongside that, consumers are demanding even more specialised um, claims, statements, things that are substantiated. So Fair Wild can provide an excellent framework for that. Okay, but um, as this slide says, don't just take our word for it. Fairwild certification has been around for a while now. We've been um, fully operational since 2010. And it's great to see that it's being recognized in the herbal products industry. So we were very pleased to be awarded um, the award for stewardship and sustainability by the MBJ in 2020. And to also um, be recognized by other NGOs, for example, the American Botanical Council, who we have a partnership developing with as well. Next slide, please. And just final couple of slides. 
uh, Fairwild does have some real ability to uh, provide unique stories from the places that these species are originating from. So I think there's all always a desire to connect and to know more about where our products are coming from. And Fairwild ingredients have some great um, connections with different ge geographies and different species around the world and also the people that are collecting them. So please do explore our website and see some of the articles that have been written about the places where the Fairwild ingredients are coming from. Next one. Okay, and because of our focus on landscape level conservation, as well as sustainable use of the wild plants, there are some real um, benefits to link products also to um, charismatic species, which can help sell, sell the story of sustainability. So we have, um, I think in the next slide, Emily, there's um, an example of fair wild certified production in, in India, where the species being harvested by trees that are in the nesting site of the great hornbill. And this provides a fantastic story and way to connect um, for people who are buying products to know more about the sites uh, where they're coming from. So I think that's all for me. Thanks very much. And I will hand back over to Emily. For the last great, session. thank you, Riley. Um, well, so now we, we know a bit more about what Fair Wild is, you know, what our, our work covers and our, our aims are. Um, I want to just take a few minutes to explain about how, um, you know, businesses and organisations and members of the public can actually get involved with Fair Wild. Um, so first off, just to explain a bit more about the different types of businesses that Fair Wild um, works with. So a Fair Wild certification that Bryony mentioned um, earlier with the, the sort of different principles in the Fair Wild standard, um, that really applies to Fair Wild collection operations. So that's the, the businesses that actually uh, the first point in the chain um, at the harvesting end. Um, so those are the companies that would be um, audited against the Fair Wild standard if, if certification is, is what they intend to pursue. Um, or they might be the ones that are implementing the standard as a best practice guide. Then businesses further up the trade chain. Um, so it, this is a simplified version. Obviously, there might be many, many, many different steps in here, but we categorize them into either a processor or a trader or a brand or a licensee. So these types of companies register directly with the Fair Wild Foundation. So they don't have an audit against the standard in the same way a collection operation does. Um, instead, they register with us, um, share details of what products they buy, who they purchase from, the volumes and so on. Um, and this allows them to make public claims about the fair wild status of the ingredients they're using. And for brands at the end of the trade chain there, so if they're making products that are um, intended for uh, sales to consumers, uh, they can also register with us to use the fair wild um, logo. So in terms of certification, Bryony's already um, sort of covered this um, a little bit, but it, it is um, based on uh, compliance with the Fair Wild um, performance indicators. Um, so it is subject to an on-site uh, audit, uh, third party by a uh, control body. Um, there is also a continuous improvement approach. So over the first five years, um, the requirements do uh, increase in terms of what is uh, the score that's required as a result of the audit. Um, and that allows businesses to really um, grow into the, the standard as well. Um, and we do also, as Brian mentioned, have a distinction between the low, medium and high risk species. Uh, so there's a risk assessment process when a company um, applies for certification or, or to add a new species to their certificate. Um, and that looks at various factors such as um, the life history of the species, the plant that's part that's being harvested um, and the impact that will have on the survival of the population in the area that the harvesting is, is occurring. Um, and we work with, four, with uh, different control bodies um, who are accredited to carry out the audits. Um, the four that are currently accredited are, are listed at the bottom there, but we're, we have an accredi accreditation system in place. So we're always open to um, new control bodies approaching us to become accredited. 
As I mentioned as well, the, at the other end of the trade chain, um, brands can use the Fairwild label on products and in marketing materials if they're using Fairwild ingredients in their products. Um, so there's a range of products um, on the market at the moment globally, um, which bear the Fairwild label. So they range from um, herbal teas, um, medicinal teas, cosmetics, um, drinks such as uh, gin, um, supplements, Ayurvedic supplements, and um, sort of supplement powders, so such as baobab powder. Um, and this use of the label, um, not just on pack, but also in communications, um, really allows businesses to celebrate the, the positive role they're playing in the sustainable harvesting of plant ingredients and the fair trading and really communicate that to their consumers as well. Um, we also just this year introduced a new type of business, um, which we're terming a micro enterprise. Um, so this is analogous to a licensee. It's a very similar um, type of um, process that uh, the businesses would go through to register with us, but it's really um, adapted for um, or businesses which are at the smaller end, so maybe just starting up um, or have a sort of more localized practice. Um, so they have uh, must have a turnover of le less than 75,000 euros a year and also limited distribution of um, products. Um, and what we've done is we've given a heavily discounted registration fee to these types of businesses um, and also eliminated uh, another type of fee which is payable by brands called turnover fees. Um, so we're hoping that this means that more um, smaller scale businesses will be able to register with Fairwild and also use um, the logo on, on their products and in communications with their customers. Um, and it is a, uh, a growing network. So we've got um, uh, certified collection operations um, across uh, the world, really. So we've got Central America, Africa, um, Eastern Europe, um, Central Asia, um, and we've got uh, registered businesses. So that's both the traders and the brands um, of, uh, across the world as well. Um, and we had two new businesses registered just this month. So it, it is growing. Um, in terms of the ingredients that are um, certified, we currently have uh, the ingredients you can see on the screen here. I mean, this list does change, so we um, keep the list on our website up to date. Um, but for example, at the moment, it uh, covers ingredients such as um, traditional Eastern European um, herbal ingredients, such as um, wild garlic, St. John's wort, dandelion root, elder, and so on. Um, but we also have certified ingredients um, that may be used more in cosmetics or um, aromatherapy, so such as um, frankincense, myrrh, um, peru balsam, um, and also uh, ingredients that are maybe more um, sort of supplement based, so such as baobab or Ayurvedic ingredients such as bibitaki and harataki, two of the main ingredients of um, the trifola compound. And we also have um, what I've termed here potential Fairwild ingredients, so nearly 50 of those. So what we mean by that is um, companies that are certified might decide to start with just one or two ingredients that they add to their Fairwild certificate, but they might trade and, and, and collect um, actually a large number more. Um, so what um, they are looking for is just interest from the market to add those ingredients to their certificate. There's also a number of companies which are currently um, interested and actively pursuing Fairwild certification um, or sort of, again, looking for that interest from the market to, to take it further. Um, so that might be businesses that have either carried out a risk analysis. So as I mentioned, um, that's when they look at whether it's a or they apply to us to do an analysis of whether it's a high, medium or low risk species. Um, and if they've taken that step or if they've had a pre-audit with Fairwild, then they would also be included as um, a potential Fairwild company. Um, and really, they're looking for um, interest from the market again to, to take that next step and actually pursue certification. Um, so there are a large number of species uh, and ingredients then that are both certified or that could be certified if there was interest from customers. Um, and one of the things that we do, um, oh, I've already sort of mentioned it a bit there, in terms of helping to grow Fairwild is um, help businesses to make connections. Um, so we have um, different parts of the, the Fairwild website help um, to connect both um, currently certified businesses, potential businesses, and also um, their potential that connect them to potential customers. 
Um, so we list the ingredients there, as I mentioned. We also list the businesses that are um, interested in pursuing certification on the website. Um, and we are always having conversations um, offline um, and by email with businesses that are interested in getting involved in Fairwild and helping to make those connections there as well. Um, and we also attend uh, industry events and carry out outreach through um, webinars and um, meetings like this. Um, in terms of the steps to certification, so this is this is quite a high level summary, um, and we do have a lot more information on our website and also uh, another webinar which went into this in a lot more detail, which is recorded and available on our website as well. Um, just to give a, a brief rundown, so to pursue certification, so that's for the wild collection operations, um, it's a process of you know determining eligibility first of all. Um, are you sourcing a wild plant ingredient is one of the first steps um, and then we encourage businesses to look at uh, how ready they really are for an audit so the fair wild standard and um, performance indicators are freely available on our website um, and those performance indicators are what are, is used as uh, during the audit so businesses can download that look at it and really do a, a very um, sort of robust assessment themselves against how, where they feel the gaps are, where they feel their strengths are, um, and what work might be needed to be done to be ready for a fair wild audit. Um, we also then, uh, as I mentioned, have this risk assessment process. So that is a process that uh, the Fair Wild Foundation administers. Um, we have a form that's available on our website as well, uh, which collects some information on um, the species and the operation that is uh, interested in pursuing certification. And there is a small fee for that as well. Um, and then the next step would be to get in touch with a uh, Fairwild accredited control body. Um, so their details are on our website or we can connect you to them. Um, and really from there, um, all of the other details for the audit are arranged directly with the control body. So they can give um, a quote uh, in terms of the cost, discuss timing and feasibility and so on. Um, and then the next step would be the audit is carried out um, and that's a two to three day process usually. Um, it does depend on the location of the operation being um, audited obviously and also the number of species. Um, but the auditors will uh, visit and uh, carry out the audit. Um, obviously at the moment uh, for the last sort of year or so there has been a slight difference in that uh, travel has been problematic to say the least. Um, so we do have um, since uh, last year, we have a sort of temporary auditing um, document, a sort of measures document, um, which does allow for remote auditing under certain conditions. Um, so for that's mainly been geared towards uh, companies which are already certified and just having a renewal audit. Um, but we do also have scope for um, new organizations to, to have an audit as well. We would just say get in touch with us to discuss what the situation is and we can advise as, as appropriate. Um, and then after the audit, uh, hopefully certification. Um, uh, there may be some um, feedback from the audit that would be some steps that might need to be carried out before the actual certifi certification can be issued, um, but that would al always be discussed with the control body. For um, the other types of businesses in the trade chain, so brands, traders and micro enterprises, it is a different process because they don't have that audit in the same way as wild collection operations. Um, so the first thing is really to be sourcing fair wild ingredients or have it lined up um, that those ingredients will be incorporated into a product or traded in. Um, we have trading and labeling rules, which are on our website um, and uh, all types of businesses are subject to the trading rules and the labeling rules. So um, reading those and sort of coming to farewell with any questions is really an essential step. Um, we then have a registration form which needs to be filled in. And for um, any businesses that are going to be using the Fairwild um, logo in uh, public communication, so that is mainly brands that this one applies to or potentially micro enterprises, we also need a license agreement in place. Um, and then we would uh, review those documents. Um, also, we uh, give approval for use of the logo and packaging design and communications. Um, and once all of those have been um, reviewed and finalized, um, the product can then be labeled or communications can be made about the farewell status of ingredients and products. So that's pretty much the sort of business side of things. Um, we've also 
got uh, various sort of outreach events as well. So one of the main ones and actually coming up in just a few months is Fair Wild Week. So this is a week every year in June, uh, towards the end of June, um, where we work with um, partner organisations. So that's both businesses that are involved in Fair Wild, um, but also um, maybe conservation organisations or um, botanic gardens and so on. Anyone really that has an interest in discussing and highlighting the role of wild plant ingredients um, to consumers. So we, um, we managed this campaign, it's as an annual online event to really try and raise awareness of wild plants and their use um, amongst consumers. Um, it is also to promote fair wild certification as a conservation standard. Um, and we aim to encourage other organizations to um, either use the practice as, uh, sorry, use the standard as best practice or to um, consider certification and using fair wild ingredients themselves. Um, and it's a, a really nice um, time of the year where there's lots of sort of diff each, each business might have their own approach to this. You know, they have their own brand, their own, their own voice, um, but it's a shared opportunity to, to re-spread that messaging and highlight the role of wild plant ingredients as well. Um, and this is open to anyone to get involved. So because it's on social media, you know, you can just um, get involved. Um, if you would be interested in learning more though, we just, just drop us an email and our email address is it's on our website, but it'll be at the end of the presentation as well. Um, we also have events, uh, other events throughout the year. So we have webinars as, as you can tell, because you're on one now, but we, we do hold these regularly throughout the year. Um, and we've got a joint one coming up on the 20th of May with uh, the Sustainable Herbs uh, Programme. Um, which is, uh, you know, American based um, organization that really celebrates the sustain and, and encourages the use of sustain of herbs sustainably um, in industry. Um, we've also had web a series of webinars last year. So as I mentioned, we had one um, looking at how collection operations can certify. And we also had another one aimed at brands and traders as well. So those go into a lot more detail what I covered quite briefly there in, in just a few slides. Um, and the recordings of those are available on our website. We also carry out training and capacity building events. Um, so in partnership with uh, partner projects is what we've termed them. Um, so that would be um, projects which are run and funded by um, sort of one of our partner organizations. Um, and we'd carry out training um, of um, potentially either um, collection operations, harvesters, auditors, um, sort of whether whatever is needed to help that project to really um, expand the experience of the fair wild standard and use of the fair wild standard in that situation. Um, as I mentioned, we also um, visit uh, trade shows, industry events and international conservation meetings to really try and fly the flag of wild plant harvesting needing to be sustainable and fair. Um, we also have an event called Fair Wild Forum. So that was going to be um, at the beginning of this year uh, but sadly, COVID <laughs> hit that like so many other things. So we are, um, because that really is, is great to have as an in-person event where we can have in-depth discussion of topics um, related to sustainable wild collection. And we are keen to have that as an in-person event um, for the next one. So the dates for that are um, to be determined. Um, but if you would like to know more, there's uh, then subscribe to our newsletter because we send out updates on, on lots of different things, but we will feature that in the newsletter as well. Um, so in terms of next steps, um, it'd be really great if you can just tell more people about what you've learned today. Um, talk to your colleagues, customers, networks about Fair Wild um, and try and spread the word about the standard um, being out there and being available as best practice guide or as a source of um, certification. Um, and if you have any questions um, coming out, then do get in touch. Um, so you can either get in touch through our website, as we said, or, or via email address. Um, and there is also a lot more information on the Fair Wild website. So after um, this webinar, um, we'll compile the recording, um, share that with everyone. And I will also include a link to our website, but also some um, specific pages on our website, such as the documents page, which has a lot of um, guidance information on there as well, um, and more detail about certification and registration and so on. Um, so it just remains for me to uh, thank our friends. So Friends of Fair Wild are those who've made a donation to Fair Wild, support the work of Fair Wild. Um, and this is another really great way, actually, that um, businesses and individuals can get involved with Fair Wild. So if 
um, you know, actually using Fair Wild certified ingredients or certification then isn't um, isn't for you right now, or you're maybe an individual, um, you can still help support our work via donating. Um, and that is at fairwild.org slash donate. So with that, um, I will say thank you so much to everyone for um, coming and uh, being interested in learning more about Fair Wild today. Um, it really is up to all of us to um, help to ensure a fair deal for people and wild collective plants. Um, so we really appreciate your interest. Um, I've included my details there. Um, so my name, just to remind everyone, is Emily King and the email address where you can actually contact either Bryony or myself is secretary at fairwild.org. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you.